Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm Rich Sands. I'm the um, product manager, uh, community manager for uh, Olo at, uh, at Black Duck Software. We just recently uh, did some um, interesting stuff with our data licensing. We uh, put the Olo data out with uh, Creative Commons license. And in the course of doing that, I learned a lot more about um, open data than perhaps I, I ever actually wanted to know. So um, what I'd like to do is uh, kind of walk through uh, some of the things that I learned and some of the issues that we ran into in the, in the course of figuring out what to do. So, click. Um, so let's talk a little about what's the definition of, of open data. So this, this actually owes a lot to the uh, open source world in terms of um, how this is defined. It's a very short uh, definition. Um, there's actually a whole lot of text that goes behind this. This came from the Open Knowledge Foundation. And um, what this says is uh, open data has to be freely redistributable. It has to allow for derived works. Um, it has to place no restrictions on field of use, no bundling restrictions, none of this, the things that um, uh, really uh, get in the way of, 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 of freedom. And it basically lets you do Let's anyone do anything as long as optionally they're attributing back to the original author and optionally um, sharing any modifications. Okay. So um, this probably sounds pretty good, right? I mean, this is pretty pretty standard uh, definition. Okay. Um, it's motherhood and apple pie. Um, <laughs> If you spend a lot of time around the free software world, the free culture world, this is a pretty standard sort of definition of, of, um, of what freedom is about. And it's laying out the principles that we can use to look at licensing, to look at data, and how it's actually being um, uh, deployed out there to see, is the data that we're looking at really open? Um, but when you actually apply this definition to the real world and you have real data, and you're um, putting it out there in different uh, legal jurisdictions, uh, and you're looking at all the different ways the data can be both used and abused, there can be some uh, unexpected and unintended consequences to this type of a model. So what I'd like to do is go through this um, model sort of step by step and look at some of the issues that actually do arise and talk about some of the, the alternative ways to think about it. <coughs> So let's start with the thing itself that we're trying to, to work with. So content or data. Um, well, already we're in the weeds because content and data are treated very differently legally. Um, so um, what ends up happening is we have to come up with a definition of open data that works across these different legal frameworks, data on the one hand, content on the other. And we want to make sure we have definitions and we have licensing that actually makes the data open, despite the fact that we've got these different things that we're mixing together. So what's content? So this is something that's been written by a person. Uh, it's been created by a person and has some original thought to it. So it might be um, uh, a drawing, or a poem, or a paragraph, or some music. Um, it might be a map. So a map is a visual representation of geodata, it's content. Content has a special characteristic. It can be copyrighted. Copyright is a special uh, right that society gives to authors to allow them to control how their uh, content is uh, copied and, and uh, redistributed. And so there's a bunch of different uh, things that go into copyright. And, and it includes things like um, uh, how long you have this special right, um, what you're allowed to control about, uh, about the content, who, who, uh, who you can, uh, um, how you can uh, determine um, what people can do with, with your content. And um, for the purposes of copyright, there has to be a little bit of originality, some spark of creativity, something. Um, even something as simple as uh, organizational, uh, 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 you know, the way you organize uh, information on a piece of paper 
uh, allows you to, to claim some originality to it. Um, so um, when something's copyrightable, the author has these rights. Okay, next. Is that Coleridge? That was actually uh, Keats. Uh, Keats. So this is a very old legal idea. It's been around for hundreds of years. Uh, in the US, uh, it's uh, enshrined right in the Constitution that the Congress has the right to, uh, to create uh, copyright laws. And those, uh, the Constitution puts that in to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. So people think sometimes that copyright is all about rewarding the authors. But that's really not what copyright's about. Its purpose is to establish this limited monopoly. And then that allows um, the author to control things for a limited period of time. Uh, and all of the precedent and all of the stuff that goes behind copyright, things like fair use and that sort of thing, are really all about um, granting these rights in order to be better for society. So it turns out that copyright is very important for open source and free culture. So if you don't have the right, you can't give that right away. So without copyright, it would be very difficult to have free software, open source, open data. Because um, with copyright, you have the right to control how your stuff is distributed and copied. And when you have that control, you grant the right to everybody else to do with it as they please, to copy it and use it, etc. But if you don't have that right through copyright, you can't grant that right to somebody else. So there's been you know, people who've said, oh, you know, we should abolish copyright. Well, if we abolish copyright, we remove whatever uh, capability we have to actually free uh, information and, and uh, free source code and free all those other things that we want to free up because we have to have the right to actually grant those freedoms. You mean we lose the right to cop to force that through copyleft? Well, we, 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 lose, we, we don't have a legal um, uh, leg to stand on in enforcing uh, software freedom. Sure. Enforced freedom? That sounds... <laughs> 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 well, there's a there's a there's a little conundrum there, but if you can find some beer, I can discuss that with you a great length. <laughs> uh, okay, so that shouldn't be too hard. So if content is all about creative or original ideas, data is just the facts. So it might be the temperature at which water freezes or lead melts, or it might be a tide table for Nantucket or it might be something like a list of names and phone numbers like what we see here. Um, you cannot copyright facts. No one owns facts. You don't get the right to control who distributes facts. So um, where do we draw the line? How little creativity do you have to apply to a body of facts in order to make it copyrightable? Very well, it turns out not a whole lot, very little. Um, however, in a very famous uh, uh, case, um, the, the Feist case, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, the Supreme Court uh, determined that just merely an alphabetized list of data, that's not enough. That's not enough. So you have to have, a, have, to have more than that. Now, it's, it's actually kind of funny to look at this because um, this was published after the Feist case, but you'll notice there's still a 9x copyright up in the upper um, right-hand corner. They just figured, well, they knew that this couldn't be copyrighted, but they put the copyright notice on there anyway just to fool people. Works for them. <laughs> so, um, uh, next slide. Now, wouldn't they argue that the, the, the data on that list is not just the alphabet as names, it's also phone numbers, right? <laughs> so it's not... It's now an extension of that. So if it was just purely names and nothing else, then it would be alphabet's list and there's nothing copyrightable there. Well, so, so the phone numbers are facts. So the fact that, that, you have, that your phone number is 555-1212, that's just a fact. It's, it's the same as, as that um, you know, the, uh, the tide is going to happen at 6.53 a.m., the high tide. 
or the one. But isn't, wasn't that why they started to actually be so defensive actually about yellow pages? Is because the yellow pages were copyrightable and they were defensible, but the white pages weren't. And so you started to see lots more combos of those books together because <coughs> it essentially, you had something of value as the... Well, and in the world of uh, dictionaries and directories, the, the mere presentation of the fact isn't enough to be copyright. You had to add a little value to it. So I used to be in the world of directories. You would actually do your formatting a little different and you would see it with random bad values. That was your extra value. So that way if somebody took a straight copy of your page and just reproduced it, and it had that bad value, you could sue them. So now they actually first, reproduced it, yeah, sanitized the data, the way. then they were safe. Because right. so, we use our personal phone number, so if we ever got a call, we had to call up legal and say, hey, you know, somebody's reproduced our directory. So. So, so let's move on to the next uh, element of this <coughs> definition, which is piece. And uh, this definition actually talks about individual data items, individual datums. But we are interested in a database, in a collection of data. Well, it turns out that for the purpose of this definition, um, if, whatever restri if you place restrictions on the database, then you're actually placing restrictions on the, the individual elements as well. But this open definition is talking about um, these individual chunks, but what, it's, what we're really interested in is the database. So, um, moving along. Next slide. Okay, so this is the Feist case. Um, this was in 1991, and this was, uh, again, this was about uh, the white pages. This was about the, the phone directory. Um, Vice Publications uh, was gathering together um, white pages from a number of different um, local phone companies and aggregating them together and just republishing them. And uh, Rural said, no, no, um, you, you're violating our copyright. And uh, this went all the way to the Supreme Court. And um, this was a very important ruling because um, it really established what the boundary is between content and data. Um, and it addressed also what happens when you compile a whole bunch of data together. So Feist again said that an alphabetized list isn't good enough, that you have to have some sort of human original, uh, some, some sort of human mental originality to go into something for it to be qualified, for it to even be copyrightable. Uh, otherwise it's just a, an unoriginal collection of facts. So for instance, um, a list of their cities and population census data can't be copyrighted. But all you have to do is say, um, here are the uh, cities and their populations for the top 10 best places to get barbecue. And as soon as you add some sort of um, a selection criteria, choice, anything like that, now that list of uh, city names and population numbers becomes copyrightable. Um, so, this is very interesting. Let's say you spend a gigantic amount of money and you compile a huge database of facts, <coughs> like for instance, you sequence the human genome, or you do a topographical map of, uh, uh, of the moon down to uh, one foot uh, resolution, and you have a gigantic database. Um, these individual facts cannot be copyrighted. So you may have spent a billion dollars collecting that set of facts, but just because you spent the billion dollars doesn't mean you actually can use copyright to save your bacon. Uh, in fact, copyright does not protect or reward the labor of collecting facts. If you compile a mega database, you better figure out a different way to protect it. So, uh, next slide. So this has a very interesting uh, effect. All of our favorite methods from the open source world, like the GPL and the Apache software license, et cetera, don't work for data. You can't copy, since you can't copyright the data, you can't apply copyright licenses. Open source licenses are copyright licenses. So, for instance, if I was to uh, create some data and I said, this data is copyright rich sands uh, and is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike license. 
tastes great, less filling, no legal, no legal effect. It's 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 a it's a, a legal non sequitur. So it turns out that if you're trying to make open data, it doesn't really matter <coughs> because the data is already free. It's the content. If you're mixing data and content, then you need copyright in order to free the uh, the content part. But the data itself is already uh, available. The facts are already free. So, and that, Rich, in, yeah. the, in your example of the top ten cities for barbecue yeah. with their populations, can so that's a mixture of data and content. Correct. Can you strip the data from that and, and say absolutely the, the population of the population of Baltimore is is, is right. uh, one and a half million. Right. You can absolutely do that. And that, that is a fact. Right. And so, just so because you found it in a list of barbecue right. cities. So, so commingling content and data doesn't protect the data. That's exactly correct. It right. does not protect the data. Well, also, I think the, there's a fine line there that data can be copyrighted, but it doesn't prevent you from charging money to sell it. All it means is that you can't enforce or you can't prevent someone else from reselling it once you buy it. That you can sell it. Yeah. There must be ways around that, otherwise Naptec and all those other companies would be out of business. Sure. The simple way around it is you put a password on it and you charge people money to get at it. And you, you must give them a, and you give them a license and you must right. be, you, they must agree to some sort of license when they open it. Exactly. All of which is not about open data. You know, there are definitely ways to make money on your on your data, but we're not talking about that part. We're talking about open data. How do you how do you get open data? Well, actually, actually, wait a minute. If there's no if there's no copyright, then there's no legal basis for a license. In other words, if, if you don't if if there's no so it's a contract license. It's, it's yeah, not yeah. a copyright license. Yeah, but well, you, you, you can sell a license like, for something else. So it's not a license for the data. I'll send you a license you, to you see can, the data. You can sell license the data. You can't the only way if you the only way is copyright. And if you have a copy of it, you can do anything you want with it, and it can't be restricted. No, no, that's not. Under contract law, you can you can basically do anything you want. That's right. You just can't use uh, copyright. I'm, actually, I'm, I'm a lawyer. And if there's no copyright, then even under contract law, unless you're going to make it a trade secret, um, you can't do anything. Right. So the fact, you're, well, you're right. So if you've compiled facts and those facts get out, yeah. then you can't protect them. Yeah. In, in, the same way you in, the in the U.S. In the U.S. Correct. So. Um, Actually, that's a good point because yeah. um, that's a great that's a great segue to the next slide. How much did that cost? Um, so things are different in Europe. In 1996, um, the Europeans adopted uh, something called the Database Directive, and the Europeans decided that they wanted to actually protect the sweat of the brow, so to speak, of the expense of compiling a big body of data, even if that data is just facts and is uncopyrightable. And so there's this extra rule in Europe which says um, that people who compile big blobs of data into databases have extra protection. And they can, they can treat that big thing of data almost as though it's copyrighted, even though it still isn't copyrighted. They get what are called uh, sui generis, I think I pronounced it right. Um, um, I think. Uh, I think. Uh, database rights. So this gets tricky because now we need a license that isn't just a copyright license to protect the content. Now we need another uh, aspect of that of a license. We want open data, and we don't want these um, database rights to be asserted. Then we need an additional. Uh, feature to our database license, which uh, essentially um, grants the, uh, the rights that are part of this uh, uh, database directive to whomever um, is using the data. So it gets a little tricky. And there's a number of open data licenses that are out there that attempt to, uh, to bridge this, this gap. So they have elements that look a lot like Creative Commons, and then they have elements that talk a lot about um, databases and use database terminology and that refer specifically to this European um, uh, uh, database uh, uh, directive. Next. Okay, so moving along, um, 
let's look at a different aspect of this open data definition. So this one seems pretty straightforward also. Um, if it's not open data unless anybody can use the data for any purpose whatsoever. No discrimination, no fields of use. That means non-commercial is not okay. Non-commercial is not free. Um, so this is also a familiar idea from the world of free and open source software. But in, this, in the world of FOSS, freeing code seems pretty benign. There's not a lot of things that, um, I mean, there are some things that can happen when you free code that are, are bad, are bad for society or bad for people. But in the case of data, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, there's a lot of potential for bad consequences. So do we really mean anyone, for instance, next slide. We're going to have a few slides we go through quickly. Spammers, um, next. Um, how about recruiters or um, government agencies or law enforcement or employers? Um, next. How about big corporations? No matter what it is that they're going to do with the data, there's things they might be considering. Next. Repressive regimes might have some interesting uh, and unfortunate uses for data. Um, next. How about financial services, insurance companies, there's all sorts of things that can happen with um, open data that open source really doesn't have to confront some of these issues. So free culture advocates typically defend freedom on principle. The more free something is, um, the better, because the benefits of freeing it up uh, outweigh the risks and the bad consequences of uh, what happens when anybody has um, these freedoms. And so I can pretty well defend the, the freedom concept for code. I mostly can defend it for data, but I have certain uh, qualms. So one problem that we ran into with OLO data that sort of I think illustrates this. So all of the, so OLO is a, this database of um, open source projects and people. We're um, scanning all the different uh, code bases and we're doing analysis on these code bases and uh, creating a, a site where you can visit it and get uh, statistics about uh, most of the open source projects that are out there in a very convenient and easy to access way. Well, so imagine you're a recruiter and you want to find the very best um, uh, Ruby, on, uh, Ruby on Rails experts. Um, well, there's a few ways that you might be able to do it. Um, you know, one way is if you're interested in looking at open source projects, you can figure out what, which projects are the, the best projects to look at for people like that. And then you go um, check out the source code yourself and um, scrape the, uh, the commit logs for email addresses and uh, do all that. So how many recruiters out there do you think really have the chops to be able to do something like that? Um, there's probably a few, but um, mostly they don't. And we'd probably talk to them if they actually got through it that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they might be, yeah, exactly. They would be, they would be qualifying themselves as interesting recruiters at that point. But Olo is doing something different. Olo is taking something that, you know, security by obscurity, so to speak, and just stripping the obscurity completely away. It sounds very easy to find the, uh, the people that you're looking for. So, um, what happens when an open source developer makes a commit and their email address show, and, and ends up in a source code repository that Olo then grabs and publishes? Well, they, when you contribute to open source, you know that you're giving up things like your email address when you put it into the, the source code repository. But you're probably not contemplating the potential consequences of that when you do that. But that data is out there and it's public. And, and because it's open source, um, it's, part, it's part of the code base. It's part of the repository that's been open sourced. And, and so that data is out there. Um, so um, with that data becoming um, uh, public, um, uh, the, you know, the issue then becomes, um, is it OK for something like OLO 
if we put yeah. if we put the data out as open data, is is it now okay by all of the people who contributed to open source that this big body of data is available very easily to anybody to, to scrape and mine and et cetera? Probably not. Makes might make some people uncomfortable. So the question yeah. is, if that's the case, why would you make it open in the first place? Well, so the data is actually already in public, so it's already out there. Um, OLO, by its nature, because we're trying to get um, uh, open source projects and contributors to work with us and to, to, uh, to use the site, uh, we've heard from a lot of uh, the people that are our primary target that um, they're really not all that keen on OLO unless the data is open. They want open data. They want to be able to use the data for, for their own dashboards and their own metrics, and they want to be able to grab it and munge it and do whatever. And they're not comfortable with a, a closed uh, data license to do that. You know, so the Apache Software Foundation, right? they're, they're just not going to use OLO unless it's open. Yes? So connect, connecting the dots, though, you're saying that if I publish something with a given license, the data that you extract from there isn't covered by that license anymore. And so you can repackage it with some other license <coughs> if you like. The, so basically, you could take my you know, Apache license code and or, you know scrape stuff out of it and publish it with GPL, which I wouldn't be OK with. No, that's not true. Because okay. the Apache's, the stuff that you're licensing with the Apache license uh -huh. is copyrightable. No, that's what I'm saying. Is, is the that facts within the, the, the facts, facts within because of the, the thing that you said before, that allows you to basically do whatever you want with it because they're just points of data. But but because you're because those facts are so tightly commingled with creative content because you've written code all around it and you it you know if you were to put a table of uh, melting points of um, of metals into um, a piece of source code. No, I'm, I'm actually thinking very specifically of my email address, right? Which, when I publish it as a part of an Apache project, I'm assuming, in my head anyway, it may not be legally correct, but in my head I'm thinking of that as being covered by the Apache license of the rest of the code around my email address. The thing is that no individual line of code is copyrightable. It's the structure, sequence, and organization of the code. So in other words, you can pull out code, you can even run rep on code to pull facts out of the code. Those facts are not copyrightable. <laughs> And certainly the facts stored in the version control repository about <coughs> one, that one person it. did something at a certain time. The metadata the is not Right. That's that, metadata, that metadata is well, not Well, that makes copyrighted. me less excited about contributing to open source. Right. And so we don't particularly want OLO to cause people to get less excited about open source because... But that was the original reason open source did it that way, was that when you committed code, you were out there, right. Right. totally naked. This was you, and you were associated with it. Sure, I get that. Yeah. But to use that fact in it's a database dangerous. somewhere that somebody's going to use to market to people with my name on it or something is not like that wasn't the intent right. Right. of so, my publishing that code. So well, that's the reason why a lot of projects, when they do mailing lists, as soon as the mailing list goes to the non-public, non-private part of the mailing list, all the identifiers are stripped out of it. Co copyright licenses control a very specific set of rights in the material, right? To use, to modify, to distribute. So there's nothing in the Apache license that you know gives someone permission to spam you. Sure. I, right. So I'm not. Arg I'm not. I'm okay, trying yeah, hard not to argue the table this one because yeah. I need to get on yeah. to the last part. Yeah. Of the yeah. Yeah. So, so I'll be uh, I'll be around sure after the uh, after the talk. last presentation if people want to talk about this some more. I didn't get through that many of my slides. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Richard.